Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Bandy Singh and I've been spearheading OTI's work related to algorithmic fairness, accountability, and transparency. Over the past year, OTI has published a series of four reports which look at how internet platforms use algorithmic decision making for a range of purposes, including content moderation, the ranking of content in search results and newsfeed, ad targeting and delivery, and when making recommendations to users. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by a great lineup of panelists to discuss the subject of our third report, which is how we can promote greater fairness, accountability, and transparency around the use of algorithmic decision making and ad targeting and delivery systems. Uh, we will have some time at the end for our panelists to answer questions. So if you have any questions, please use the question and answer functions and we will do our best to get back to you. Um, so now I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. First, we have Joe Westby, who was a researcher on technology and human rights at Amnesty International in the United Kingdom, where he focuses on the human rights implications of big data, AI, and the power of tech. He is currently leading Amnesty's emerging program of work tracking the systemic threat to human rights posed by the surveillance-based business model underpinning the internet. Next, we have Lindsay Kerr, who is a Democratic Staff Director and Chief Counsel on the Senate Rules Committee under Ranking Member Amy Klobuchar. She works on a broad portfolio of issues related to campaign finance, election law, and national security. Next, we have Morgan Williams, who is General Counsel at the National Fair Housing Alliance, where he is responsible for leading the office's strategic and tactical legal initiatives and affairs, and where he directs NFHA's efforts to pursue pioneering litigation under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And last but not least, we have Natalie Marischal, who is a Senior Policy Analyst at Ranking Digital Rights, where she leads RDR's policy engagement and policy development efforts. Natalie led the expansion of RDR as Corporate Accountability Index's methodology to address human rights risks associated with tech companies, business models, with a particular emphasis on the role of targeted advertising and algorithmic systems. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanted to first kick it off with a question for Joe. Um, so in one of your latest reports titled Surveillance Giants, How the Business Model of Google and Facebook Threatens Human Rights, you've outlined how control over our digital lives is one of the primary human rights challenges today, and it is something that we would never tolerate from a government. Can you talk a little bit about how we got here, especially with regard to uh, the use of algorithms in targeted advertising? Sure, thanks. Uh, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so yeah, we, we looked at the, uh, the business model that underpins the, the data economy, um, what some have called the original sin of the internet, which is, of course, the tech companies drive profit by uh, knowing more and more about our digital lives in order to sell more finely targeted ads. And I think it's now widely recognized this model is broken. Um, we you know, analyzed it from a human rights perspective and ar we argue that this business is, um, because it is predicated on surveillance, um, ubiquitous and invasive surveillance of people's digital lives. Um, it is a threat to human rights on a vast global scale, um, really affecting billions of people. Um, and, the, the rights that we're talking about here is, um, of course, privacy, um, insofar as this business model is really the opposite of privacy. Um, it, it, it relies on knowing um, more or less everything about you when, when you um, operate in the digital world and using that to uh, target you with, with, with ads. Um, uh, but there's also this now knock-on effects that have been widely documented uh, on a whole range of other human rights, including non-discrimination, freedom of expression, um, even freedom of thought. Um, and this is all linked to the ways that tech companies have the power to kind of shape and control our information environment and influence our thoughts and behaviours um, through the use of the, these, this model on, uh, on, their, on their platforms. Um, and we, um, I think we, you know, we've now seeing these uh, harms, examples of the harms and the kind of knock-on effects um, over and over again. You know, micro-targeting of um, opaque political messaging in elections, you know, amplifying hate speech in some cases leading to actual violence, um, enabling discriminatory ad targeting, um, uh, and you know, 
uh, illegally targeting children and collecting their personal information. This is all kind of comes back to the same problem with the, the ad driven business model underpinning these, these platforms. Um, we focused in particular on, on Google and Facebook, not just as pioneers of the model, but um, because of their dominance um, over not only digital advertising, but over the, the, the global public square, um, the channel, channels that we rely on uh, in the modern world to engage um, with, with everything uh, in, in the digital world, you know, search, social media, messaging, um, video, smartphones, um, and this goes hand in hand with the business model. Um, it, it has uh, the 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 business model has both enabled these companies to to grow and uh, obtain this this dominant position, and also um, it exacerbates and amplifies the the harms that that we're seeing. Um, so. You know, I think to your question, actually, just if I may really briefly on, on the question of kind of how we got there, I think it's really important to look back at how this has evolved over the past two decades, because, um, you know, we've got to the point where we just uh, accept that this is the way the Internet works. But we need to remember that firstly, this the, the Internet wasn't always reliant on this business model and there are alternatives. Uh, and secondly, that the problems that we're seeing now are entirely predictable. Um, almost two decades ago, the privacy campaign group Epic um, spoke at the, at the Senate warning of the long term implications of profile based advertising and the need for strong privacy laws. And the fact that those warnings weren't heeded is why we um, are where we are now and that the self regulation has failed. Uh, and really, we need to now look at how we go about kind of changing this, this, this business model and putting in place stronger oversight over the 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 ad targeting um, algorithms um, ad targeting delivery um, al algorithms underpinning these platforms thanks Joe um, next I want to turn to Natalie Natalie in your recent report series you talk significantly about the influence targeted advertising can and has had Exemplified through, for example, Russian interference, radicalization, and misleading advertising. Talk about what specifically makes these algorithmic ad systems so powerful, and why our focus needs to be on the business models of these internet platforms rather than just the content. Thanks, Pandy, and thanks so much for having me. Um, so I want to start by by elaborating a bit on, on what Joe said about how the, the how the targeted advertising business model influences uh, the way that the rest of the platform, the part that the that users uh, that makes users flock to the platforms, uh, because I'm very sorry, uh, platforms, but nobody's coming to your to your platforms for the purpose of finding targeted advertising. That's just something that we kind of have to sit through to get to uh, to post from our friends and family. Um, and you know whatever else we we, we want to engage with uh, there. Um, in order to, to deliver targeted advertising and to make a lot of money from it, you need two things. You need a lot of data about your users, both who they are and what they do. And two, you need your users to spend as much time as possible so you have as much eyeball space, so to speak, uh, to, to rent out or, or sell to your, to your advertisers. So that creates a set of powerful incentives uh, that have led the social platforms uh, that, that, that we know and um, love or love to hate or hate to love, uh, perhaps, uh, and, and how, we, how we engage with them. So, the comment, so the, the, I, th I think most of us by now are pretty familiar with the idea that um, engagement, uh, meaning how much, uh, how much eyeball time is spent on platform, how much you click, how much you, you read, uh, is, uh, is, is used as, a, as, a proc as, the, as the, the, the metric. Uh, that, that companies use to, uh, to determine uh, how much ad space they have to sell uh, in a way. And so everything about how the platforms uh, work is designed to drive engagement. So that's why platforms want to show you uh, content that they think you're more, more likely to click on, more likely to read, uh, more likely to have an emotional response to. Um, and those are things that can be measured by computers. Uh, on the other hand, there's a whole lot of other things that I would argue are much more important that can't be measured by computers. So how true, uh, how factually accurate something is, how beneficial to society something is, whether something is a, a public service message, perhaps about public health, 
or if something is, um, I don't know, for, sports score or uh, the latest uh, celebrity cheating scandal, right? Uh, a computer cannot tell the difference between these things. That's something that requires human judgment. Um, because companies aspire to aspire to operate at massive scale, they have to rely on this kind of automation, uh, which means that not only that the things that can be measured again by machines end up being the things that count, and the things that again I would argue truly count uh, don't get measured and are at best afterthoughts in. Um, in, in the calculation of what content gets gets amplified and gets shown the most, uh, at worst, uh, gets dismissed as something that's entirely subjective and therefore not real and therefore not true, right? And that's where you get the, the discourse around companies not wanting to be the arbiter of truth. Um, it's not because it's not possible to, to, to discern truth. In many cases, there, there is a difference between actual facts and complete nonsense, right? Um, but it's not something that can be easily discerned uh, by machines or something sometimes not not discernible by machines at all um, the second bit and this this is where the data part comes in is that in order to uh to to uh, to, to t in order to be able to, in order to charge uh, the highest rates you can. As a company, you need to be able to tell your advertisers that you have access to many more eyeballs than anybody else. So there again is where the, the scope and the reach comes in, right? And the need to rely on, on, on automation. And you also want to be able to tell them that you have the best data to help them reach exactly who it is that they want to reach with their message. You know, there's an old, uh, an old saying from, um, from the Madison Avenue uh, heydays of, uh, of advertising that half of ad all advertising money is wasted. The problem is that you don't know which half. The, the, the promise of targeted advertising is to allow advertisers to know exactly which half is being wasted so that you're only uh, showing um, detergent ads to people who actually buy detergent as opposed to the members of the household who have nothing to do with with detergent purchases that you only show your political ads to people who are uh, registered voters in the correct uh, jurisdiction and who are either persuadable or you know likely to turn out for your party but you just need to you need likely to vote for your party but you need to motivate them to actually take the the step uh, towards voting. Um, so what's what's the what's the downside of all this? Well, the downside of all that is um, that first of all, much of this data, and I would argue most of this data, is collected in illegitimate ways, either because people don't know that the data is being collected, that um, it's being collected in a coercive manner that you can only use the service that you need in order to participate in society by allowing this data to be collected about you, or it's then used for purposes that are not the purposes that you agreed to. So one example would be when you, uh, when you give your cell phone number to a platform to use for two-factor authentication, which is a way of, of adding another measure of, of security to make sure that people who are not you can't hack into your account. And then that um, cell phone number is used for um, for your advertising profile or is sold to um, you know a host of, of shady actors who then use them to uh, to to, uh, to you know call you and try to sell you things or for for robocalls that's 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 a breach of the maybe not a in in the legal sense a breach of contract but certainly in the um, in in the in the moral sense and uh, so because so much of this data is acquired in an illegitimate way, that means that anything that you do with it is uh, fruit of the poisonous tree, uh, to use uh, to use a, a legal uh, framing. Um, so, it, so it's illegitimate. But, but then all in addition to that, and that I think should be reason enough in, in my view, but um, as Joe was saying, in addition to that, it leads to discrimination harms. And that's something that uh, Morgan will talk a lot um, about, I'm sure in the context of, um, of his organization's lawsuit and, and, and the settlement, but I, I won't. So I, I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but um, but it also leads to uh, violations to, uh, to to freedom of speech, to access to information, and to to freedom of thought, uh, as Joe said. Uh, so you know, so I think we have to think about what the, the not just the, the specific harms that come from the advertising. Uh, they are real, uh, and, and Morgan's going to talk about that. But we also need to consider the the impact, the set of incentives that that creates, and how that uh, leads companies to create um, content curation algorithms, the ones that decide which which of the many posts you could be seeing, you end up seeing, and in what order, um, and and how that uh, in turn impacts. Uh, the way that you perceive the world and, and the way that, um, that, that you operate within it. 
Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Lindsay, I wanted to turn it to you now. Uh, since the 2016 U.S. presidential elections, in which we saw foreign actors influencing the elections through the use of social media platforms and their targeted ad systems, uh, Senator Klobuchar, who you work for, has been a fierce proponent of expanding disclosure requirements for political ads online. Could you talk about the Honest Ads Act, which has been the main vehicle for these efforts, and how it strives to encourage greater transparency and accountability from platforms? Sure, thank you, Sandy and OTI, and for all the other panelists um, for, for hosting me today and um, for participating. As you mentioned, um, Senator Klobuchar is the top Democrat on the Senate Rules Committee, which has jurisdiction over federal elections. And she joined the committee not long after the 2016 election, where we know Russia so brazenly interfered um, in our democracy. And so the top priority for Senator Klobuchar since she joined the committee is to secure our elections and to stop or combat the spread of disinformation online. Uh, and out of the gates, you know, we had hearings after hearings after 2016 uh, about exactly what the Russians did. Um, and one of the things that I think outraged people so much was that we know that Russian operatives bought ads on Facebook with Google. Uh, and so we got to work very quickly uh, after learning, learning that, um, to, to find ways that we can build more transparency and accountability on online platforms, specifically related to online political ads. Uh, and one of the things that we came up with was the Honest Ads Act, which is a very simple piece of legislation that says if you sell political ads online, whether they be uh, candidate ads where you're advocating for um, or against the external direction, um, or an issue ad, which is really important because we know that um, or use issue ads to sow, to sow discord and division a lot, and they target those ads specifically. Um, I, I think in, in 2016, the Senate Intelligence Committee said that um, African Americans were the most targeted group uh, in terms of disinformation before necessary. Uh, so the issue ads is a, a really critical piece of that. So if you're selling issue ads on your platform or political ads, those ads have to have a very clear disclaimer on them about who paid for them, uh, and you have to have file um, to disclose the ads where the public, academics, journalists can go and easily access those ads um, in a library. That is consistent with what we have, the laws that we have in the books now for ads that are sold on TV, radio, and in print. Uh, and when those laws were written, um, the proliferation of online ads wasn't really contemplated. And so our technology has you know, taken off in terms of the, the number of ads that are sold online, billions and billions of dollars, uh, and our laws have not caught up. And so the Honest Ads Act puts online political ads in the same, same footing as, as other ads. It's a really simple bill. Um, it has bipartisan support. So when we, when we first introduced it uh, in 2017, right after the election, um, the late Senator McCain was our lead Republican on the bill. Um, which made sense because he was, uh, you know, the, the architect of, of McCain-Feingold, the campaign finance bill, um, and, and was very passionate about disclosure and disclaimers um, for, for campaign ads. Uh, and Senator Warner is our um, Democrat, um, Democratic partner. He's the, the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So he understands probably more than anyone um, the what exactly foreign adversaries are doing, how they're using these platforms and manipulating them to, um, to undermine our democracy. Uh, and when we reintroduced it again this year, Chairman Graham, who's the chairman of the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, is the chief Republican sponsor of the bill. Uh, and I think, you know, most people, when you tell them what the bill does, uh, it seems like common sense. I think if you were to put it on the Senate floor today, it would pass, already passed the House. Um, we, uh, the, the Republican leader doesn't support the legislation, so that's, that's our roadblock, but it's a really simple piece of legislation. Uh, and now with what we're seeing, um, just the, the, the sort of, the, the manipulation uh, and um, the craziness that we're seeing online, I think uh, a lot of people would, would say that the Honest Access Act is, is an absolute basic necessity and something that we should build off of in terms of transparency and accountability. Uh, for online, for online um, advertising. And I, I'll say, you know, when we introduced the legislation, we did work closely with some of the biggest platforms to see, 
you know, how it could work. Uh, and to, to Natalie's point, um, because a lot of at scale, all the at scale, um, are, are, are done without human interaction, it, it is difficult. Uh, and the platforms initially said, we don't think this is, you know, at least entirely something that we can implement. Um, and, and they quickly realized that they could. Uh, and platforms like Facebook and Twitter have begun voluntarily implementing um, the honest access. So they, they do have disclaimers. There is an ad library. None of it is perfect. It's not, you know, complete. Um, it's not complete implementation. And from ranking member publisher's perspective, I think what you'll what she would say is, you know, it's great that they're voluntarily doing this. It is absolutely not a substitute for, for passing the bill. And we cannot not trust these companies to talk to. And I think that's really, really self-evident. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there in terms of explaining the physical bill. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and Morgan, I'd like to turn it to you next. So in March 2018, NFHA and three of its member organizations filed a lawsuit against Facebook, alleging that the company's ad platform enables landlords and real estate brokers to exclude people of color, women, people with disabilities, and other protected groups from receiving housing ads. The lawsuit resulted in a settlement that drove a number of changes across the company's ad platform. Could you talk about the scope of the lawsuit and what kinds of changes it resulted in? Sure, um, and thank you so much for the chance to be here. Um, the National Fair Housing Alliance is a national office that works to ensure compliance with the Fair Housing Act. It's based in DC, but it has a network of local offices that are our, our membership across the country, local fair housing centers. And it's with three of these offices that we carried out an investigation of Facebook's ad platform and, and ultimately pursued federal litigation in the Southern District of New York. and and, and regards to the uh, alleged discriminatory conduct uh, of the, the platform's operations in the algorithms that um, manifest the, the targeted categories that were used in the ad targeting features, um, as well as other concerns associated with the operation and the ad and its, and its delivery functions. Um, in, in short, um, in actually in, in November of 2016, ProPublica ran an ad article featuring Facebook's ad platforms and the extent to which you can target those ads based on ethnic affinity. And, and essentially, uh, that was a, 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 a term that Facebook advertisers used to refer to race and racial targeting of, of advertisements. And so um, there was a significant outcry as a function of this. We heard from our members across the country, from our federal legislative, uh, legislative partners, uh, with regards to concern over this and immediately reached out to Facebook in a letter noting concern over what was what was identified in the in the publication and, and what we had identified in some preliminary investigative work as a function of the of, 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 of the outcry. Um, Facebook was responsive and asserted that they would be changing their their, their operations. We met with them uh, several times in the following weeks and uh, that February of 2017, they issued notice that they were they were changing their platform to remove these discriminatory features in their in their targeting operations. Uh, the following fall, Pope up we a second uh, story that showed that Facebook had not in fact changed its operations, and that the same ads that ProPublic had ran before they were able to to run. And and at that point, we shifted our our gear from sort of shifted our focus from advocacy with Facebook to uh, enforcement oriented investigation under the Fair Housing Act. There's very strong organizational standing or the ability for private fair housing offices to pursue investigations and enforcement of discriminatory conduct in the housing market. And the Fair Housing Act is very clear that it's, just, it's, just, it's, it's illegal to express a discriminatory preference in advertising. And it's not only illegal for housing providers or housing service providers to do so, but for publishers themselves to publish those discriminatory ads. Um, and, uh, and so there's a long history of enforcement against publications. NAFA, in fact, in, in 2009, brought a lawsuit against American Classified, the largest classified company, classified advertisement company uh, in, in the country at the time for both uh, print and on online ads. Um, and we were involved in amicus engagement in the 2009 litigation in both the Craigslist.com Seventh Circuit decision and the 
roommates.com, Ninth Circuit decisions, the first set of Ninth Circuit decisions that went before the Ninth Circuit in that, in that case, and, uh, and dealing with the issues of the scope of the Communications Decency Act immunity to housing discrimination claims in, in, in those cases and in subsequent cases. And we then and since have long adhered to the, to the principle that the Fair Housing Act should not be uh, relegated to print <laughs> Uh, advertising and should apply online just as it does to print advertising and that the immunity of the Communications Decency Act should not apply to housing discrimination. And, um, and, and in fact, in our litigation against Facebook, in the motion to dismiss briefing that was filed, they asserted Communications Decency Act defenses. And, uh, and, and, and we briefed our responses to that. Notably, uh, the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest or amicus brief in support of our arguments around the application of Communications Decency Act immunity and the application of the Fair Housing Act to Facebook's operations. Um, because we settled, that uh, legal decision was not rendered on those open questions, but there is currently other briefing that's pending in other litigation in which Facebook has similarly asserted this defense in which there may be uh, further case law on this question. In any case, we did uh, reach a settlement with Facebook in which, uh, in partnership with a couple of other pieces of pending litigation, in involving the employment sector in particular, uh, in which Facebook agreed to change their uh, housing ad platform to preclude housing, house, uh, ads that are um, in regards to housing, credit, or employment services, to not allow those advertising, advertisements to engage Facebook's targeting ad platform in a number of notable ways. One, it drastically limits the targeting features to a set of targeting options that were uh, jointly agreed upon by the plaintiffs and Facebook. Um, two, it, uh, it restricts um, a lot of the targeting features around geography and other things that you could use to engage in discriminatory, uh, segregating advertising practices. And three, it, it limits um, what was referred to as Facebook's lookalike feature to a now reconstituted special ad audience, which um, removes a lot of the filtering features on Facebook's ad platform uh, um, uh, uh, tool um, that allows advertisers to target uh, existing customer base or identified pool of individuals. Um, we still have outstanding concerns about the reconstituted special ad audience to the extent that um, it's limited to targeting users on the basic basis of like internet usage. And, uh, and we think that there's um, probably a lot of instances in which that's problematic. And under the settlement, Facebook has specifically agreed to study that operation and the discriminatory effects of that operation and confer with us about further changes to that part of the platform. Um, it's noteworthy, um, and I'll, I'll stop here, um, definitely ramble on further about this and really would welcome any questions in particular coming out from listening to the roundtable discussion that preceded this it's very compelling and um, some noteworthy, I think, relevance to some of the work in, in this case. But um, we'll just add that there's um, a HUD investigation that was reopened in part as a function of uh, the lawsuit that we had filed, um, but was a secretary initiated complaint that HUD issued a charge on in uh, March of 2019, um, shortly after we announced the settlement of our of our lawsuit, which referred the matter to the Department of Justice for enforcement. And in considering kind of outstanding concerns around Facebook's operation, I would say that they're principally twofold. One is in regards to the potentially discriminatory function of their special ad audience feature as it's been reconstituted. And two is in some of the research that's been published more recently since our settlement on the delivery function of Facebook's ad platform and the extent to which um, separate apart from the um, ad campaign that is programmed into what is launched into um, <clears throat> Facebook's ad platform, that the algorithm that Facebook uses to sort how those different campaigns are prioritized and delivered to viewers um, skews, potentially skews results in a discriminatory way. And there's outstanding concern about that. The uh, Department of Justice has not filed suit. So, ostensibly, it's 
likely that they're in some form of settlement negotiations, and it may be that they're focused on these two outstanding issues that are subject of concern. Thanks, Morgan. Um, so now I would like to open some questions up for the panel as a whole. Um, so as we've discussed, the use of algorithms for ad targeting and delivery purposes can perpetuate harmful outcomes, biases, and discrimination. Um, what kind of mechanisms can be leveraged to reduce the instances of such harmful outcomes and promote greater transparency and accountability around the instances that do take place? Um, some examples that I know we've all discussed and mentioned in some of our reports are algorithmic audits and impact assessments. Um, so I'd love to get um, your thoughts on that. And maybe first I'll turn it over to Natalie. Uh, thanks, Bandy. Uh, so I think there's there's three main areas of uh, of intervention uh, that uh, that I think are, are particularly fruitful for the U.S. Congress to pursue. Um, the first one is mandatory transparency um, that goes that you know I think cannot can and, sh and probably should start with the Honest Ads Act, uh, but going beyond that to apply to not just political ads but other types of ads in general and. Um, because I think I think if if among the many many lessons we've learned over the the, the past six months of of life in the time of coronavirus is that um, uh, political ads is not the only place that harmful disinformation uh, can can circulate right. Um, so that's that's the first place, but also looking at, uh, at, at transparency around how all content, both paid content like advertising and uh, user generated content is governed uh, on the Internet. This is very different from uh, having the government set the rules. Uh, right. We're not that is that is not an appropriate thing for the US government to do uh, and that in fact would be contrary to the to the First Amendment, uh, but I think it is appropriate for um, for the government to uh, require certain measures of transparency about what the rules are, how they're enforced, uh, th what the appeals process is, because there should be an appeals process, uh, because no, no company is going to get it right every single time, right? That's not what we should aspire to. We should aspire to having a functional appeals process and then publish numbers about, uh, about the outcomes, uh, how much content is taken down, what type of content, uh, through what mechanism, uh, Etc. The second place uh, where I think, and that I think is going to be the most, uh, possibly both the most difficult to negotiate, but also the most impactful, is federal privacy uh, legislation. You know, there's been a lot of talk recently in Washington, uh, and it's likely to continue to be, about uh, reforming or possibly even eliminating the Communications uh, Decency Act. I'm very sympathetic uh, and, and agree with um, um, most of the goals uh, that are being pursued uh, through through this avenue, but I just don't think that uh, the the that um, uh, intermediary liability is the way uh, to to get to that. Um, perhaps clarifying, uh, you know, that uh, what was and was not the original intent of of the CDA, um, could, because it, it there is a, a growing legal consensus that uh, many of the the court uh, the court decisions that uh, Morgan referred to uh, were decided in ways that were just not consistent with what the CDA was actually meant to do. Um, I think that that's something that's that's worth talking about. But I think more importantly than that, the way to prevent these harms from happening is through uh, privacy legislation. Uh, we have a, a framework um, in, um, in, our, in our latest report series. Uh, I'm not sure whether we're able to, to share the link um, through, through a chat uh, here within Zoom or not, but uh, if not, I'll certainly be, be tweeting it out. Um, that outlines what we think uh, a federal privacy legislation uh, should, uh, should, should focus on so that the types of, uh, of harmful discrimination and uh, illegitimate data collection uh, that, that we've been talking about can't take place. And then the third piece, uh, which I think is probably the, the, the wonkiest and, and perhaps least sexy to talk about, has to do with uh, corporate governance reform. Uh, so that has to do with how companies govern themselves. Uh, there's been a, a lot of talk about um, how uh, the the, C the CEOs of, of Facebook and, and and Google in particular have these dual roles of uh, being both CEO of the company and chairman of the board of directors, and on top of that, thanks to uh, a dual class share structure that um, that's that's very popular in the tech sector, um, they have more they control more more votes than anybody else, which puts them in a position of essentially being dictators of their companies and are completely immune from the type of oversight that a board of directors uh, or the 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 fact that they have shareholders right in our publicly traded company is meant to, to do. 
Um, so I think there's there's a lot of of, uh, of, of innovation to, to have there. Um, there are actions that uh, entities that are not the U.S. Congress uh, should be pursuing. Uh, you know, I think antitrust is, and I know that there's a there's been a, a House Judiciary hearing uh, just announced for, for later this month that we'll focus on. But that's that's something that I think at at this point is mostly out of the hands of, of Congress and in the hands of, of antitrust uh, regulators. Uh, so I think I think those are the, the but it is it is indeed worth uh, pursuing. Uh, just on a separate track uh, from the the legislative options that I just mentioned. Thanks, Natalie. Um, and would any of our other panelists like to jump in? Yeah. Hi. Um, just, uh, go, go ahead, Joe. Let's go with Joe first. Yeah. Sorry. You, okay. Thanks. Uh, I'll I'll just be very brief. Just um, you know. Um, Certainly, uh, we welcome all of the uh, recommendations that Natalie has just uh, outlined. Just building on that for a couple of, of others from our point of view, I mean, I think going back to this 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 um, point around platform power and the the dominance of of a handful of tech platforms, um, I think really we need measures that will um that will tackle that and encourage a more kind of pluralistic internet um so antitrust could potentially be one of the tools in in, in the arsenal of uh, of states uh, and regulators um uh, interoperability as well i think is is an important um uh, technical uh, standard which should be which should be much more greatly enforced to to enable others uh, other platforms to to develop and then I think one other thing which we think is really um, high priority is um, uh, really to uh, make it uh, le new legally binding um, protections to stop platforms from forcing um, users to accept this uh, surveillance based business model because um, currently how um, uh, what we see is that the um, effectively users have no choice but to uh, sign up to um, this kind of invasive profiling and targeting in order to use services which which everybody now relies on um, uh, and so really you have a false choice where um, either you don't benefit from the uh, modern world and the, the digital world um, or you consent to this model which is um, uh, abusive of, you, of, of human rights. Um, and so I think that kind of needs to be uh, a, a first step that governments should look at in, in so far as people should have the choice to opt out meaningfully um, from these kind of practices. Thanks, Joe. And Morgan, just before I turn it over to you, I just want to remind everyone in the audience that if you would like to ask a question to use the Q&A function. Um, and now, Morgan, on to you. Thanks. Just a brief comment in regards to the question about tools for accountability and transparency in terms of civil rights enforcement and accountability uh, for civil rights protections. One of the most important tools that we have at, at our disposal is, is disparate impact liability, which is separate and apart from intentional discrimination claims, but are involved claims in which a policy that's neutral or non-discriminatory its, on its face, when put into practice, has a discriminatory outcome. And that can be a very powerful tool when talking about algorithmic operations. And unfortunately, uh, well, that's a very powerful tool that's at our disposal. HUD in 2013 issued a rule that provides a lot of uh, common um, <clears throat> understanding for what a standard of disparate impact liability should be, unifying a lot of the different circuit analysis that is out there. And in 2015, the US Supreme Court issued a decision in uh, Texas Department of Community Affairs, Housing and Community Affairs versus the Inclusive Communities Project that upheld disparate impact liability under the Fair Housing Act. And it's actually on the basis of this Supreme Court decision that the current administration is actually proposing a new uh, disparate impact rule um, <clears throat> that would completely upend the ability to bring disparate impact cases and in particular has a specific defense regarding any practices that are associated with algorithmic operations in which the inputs 
used in the algorithmic model are not themselves substitutes or close proxies for protected characteristics, and the model is predictive of risk or some other objective. And anyone who knows algorithmic models knows that that's an absurd defense because it's not individual inputs that contribute to the output of an algorithmic model, but the relationship between different inputs. And so such a defense really would provide a kind of safe harbor immunity for any practices that are based on algorithms. This is a proposed rule that um, HUD accepted comments on this past fall and that a number of folks in the tech civil rights world were very responsive to and really appreciate everyone's engagement on that in partnership with the, the fair housing and, and broader civil rights world. Um, HUD sent a, a proposed final rule to OIRA, the agency responsible for securing final interagency review of that final rule in early May, May 7th and is poised to issue that final rule any day now. So please be on the lookout. Um, I think if, if you are interested in engaging advocacy, in advocacy on this issue, there is the opportunity to actually schedule meetings with OIRA, the agency that's coordinating that interagency review, and confer with them about your concerns about at least what was in the proposed rule. We don't know what's in the proposed final rule now. Um, but additionally, we'll be looking to um, challenge that final rule um, on the basis of potential Administrative Procedure Act claims, and there may be avenues for some folks in this space to be, you know, potential litigants in challenging provisions specifically that deal with algorithms. Additionally, we'll be working with any future administrations to, to, to rescind these terrible new standards that are being put out there to roll back civil rights protections in this space. Thanks, Morgan. Um, Lindsay, would you like to jump in? Sure. I, I, the thing I'd say is to- I'm sorry, Lindsay, would you mind coming a little closer to your screen? It's hard to hear you. Sure. Is that better? It's a little better, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the things that Natalie said, she talked about Section 230 reform, uh, and that's something that is being discussed heavily uh, in, in the public Congress right now. I think that there are multiple um, senators on both sides of the aisle who are very interested, and we're seeing sort of um, different bipartisan bills crop up. I think conservatives are motivated by the myth that the algorithms are biased against them. Um, and I think that on the Democratic side, we're motivated for all the reasons that we're discussing here, here right now. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's something you're going to see more of. I know Vice President Biden has, has made it clear he supports security reform um, and, and many others. Uh, I'll also say, you know, I think um, when we have regulators like the FTC issuing uh, fines for wrongdoing and lawlessness on behalf of some of these platforms, just a year ago, we, we had the FTC decision um, about Cambridge Analytica and the $5 billion fine, which is the biggest fine ever. But, you know, when you make $55 billion a year, it's nothing. Uh, so I think having, um, you know, having regulators really, you know, put some teeth behind um, some of the fines and the punishments would go a long way as well. Thanks. Um, so I'll turn it now to audience questions. Um, the first one, um, what should multi-stakeholder collaborations around promoting accountability around digital advertising algorithms look like? Um, in particular, how can industry, government, uh, civil society, and civil rights groups better engage? Um, and what are like the main challenges that you see um, in trying to push this kind of work forward? Um, maybe I can turn it to Joe first, if you want to take that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I think that there is um, a lot that can be done in the short term through kind of multi-stakeholder collaborations. Um, I mean, I think following the, the, the previous question, ultimately this is going to require um, state-based regulation and and binding laws, self-regulation has failed. Um, but uh, I think, in at least in the short term, there are um, discussions that can be had between um, affected uh, kind of communities or representatives of affected communities and 
um, the big platforms in order to uh, put in place uh, better kind of systems and mitigation measures um, that the companies can adopt. I mean, actually, I think that the, I know it's a, uh, the, the, the um, Stop Hate for Profit campaign, which is, is, uh, is obviously very live at the moment, you know, I think that's a good example of, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues there which overlap with what we're discussing and which really like tie back to the, to the problems of the business model um, and and there's some really concrete recommendations that the campaign has like putting in place a c-suite executive um, with civil rights expertise in facebook and i think those kind of steps it um would be would be really important and really impactful um, um until we can put in place these these longer term uh, laws and regulations that actually um protect people kind of across the board. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Natalie? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think there's been an evolution of the, the civil society and, and multi-stakeholder discourse around platform accountability. Um, you know, I think the, the early years of, of social media platforms uh, in general were, were filled with a, a lot of, uh, of optimism around the, the positives that, that these new tools could bring for, uh, for, for, for activism, for social movements, and, and, and more. Um, and, uh, you know, starting around, uh, you know, the middle of the past decade, I think there, there was a growing realization of, of the harms uh, that could come to, to, to movements and to activists and, and others from, from relying so much uh, on these platforms and what happens when, uh, you know, an activist, con activist content gets taken down and how can you get it restored and how can you appeal uh, and so on. Uh, and then I think after, you know, I think 20, the year 2016 was a big wake up call certainly for social, uh, social movements in, in the West, uh, you know, with the, the twin tragedies of, um, of Brexit and, uh, and, and the 2016 US election. Um, and yes, I, I do view those both of those events as, as tragedies, um, because there were just such such clear self owns by 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 two of the world's uh, power most powerful democracies. Um, but I think since then we've we've all collectively spent a lot of time reflecting and analyzing and and, and looking at data to to better understand uh, exactly what happened. Uh, and I think that. That that understanding uh, exists there now. It's 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 disputed to be sure, but I think we do have uh, a, a, a solid collective understanding of, of what happened. Um, and now we're we're I think now that what's happening is uh, is is the building of a consensus around what needs to be done. Um, and I'm, I've been I am encouraged by the progress that's been happening over the the past few years. Uh, you know, the understanding that uh, platforms are, are, are have, have too much power and that they're unaccountable. And now the, the debate that I see happening is on exactly what the, the tactics are uh, for getting there. You know, I do think there's a shared vision for what the outcome needs to be, right? Uh, the te a technology sector that is um, uh, more responsive to democratic oversight, to human rights, to, uh, to the needs and interests of, of the public and not just to uh, to their own bottom lines and, and, and their shareholders' pockets. Uh, but now we're talking about what tactics um, will be needed to, uh, to, to get there. And, and I, for one, am, am hopeful that uh, that's a conversation that's going to, uh, to mature very quickly, uh, especially if new channels for activism uh, emerge after, um, after the 2020 election here in the US. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Morgan or Lindsay, would you like to jump in? Okay, um, so the next question we have is for Morgan. Um, how do you think lawsuits such as the one that NFHA helped lead can play a role in promoting greater accountability around the use of these algorithmic systems? Um, and what are some of the key lessons that were learned in the process? Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, I think lawsuits, lawsuits can, can play a very important role in changing the practice of, of individual operators, but also in informing the market more broadly about where prospective liability may lie. Um, just recently, HUD announced some changes that Google was making to its platform in regards to its targeting features um, in the housing space, and in particular around the use of, of zip code and other geographic targeting features as they may be used in, in the housing sector. And, uh, and, and that kind of enforcement can help to um, educate the market about um, the scope of that kind of liability, 
mean, additionally, there are open questions about the scope of the relationship between the Federal Fair Housing Act and the Communications Decency Act. And those questions, you know, um, may be decided in some fashion through legislative means down the road, but um, they are open questions that, you know, may be decided in the courts in future litigation. And though our case settled and those legal questions were left open, there are other cases that remain and other litigation that, you know, we may pursue against other parties that may help to, to sort of clarify some of those legal questions in ways that we think would expand the scope of, of civil rights protections in this space. Thanks, Morgan. Um, the next question is for the panel as a whole. So we've talked about uh, forms of legislation such as the Honest Ads Act, um, which is an example of policymaker action that tries to promote greater transparency around um, online advertising. There have also been other bills that have been introduced, and as Natalie mentioned, some of them have raised some First Amendment concerns because they try to direct um, how platforms uh, regulate their content. Um, so, would love to get everyone's thoughts on what should policymaker, sorry, look, what should policymaker action look like in this space? Um, do you think that uh, sort of the bills that have been put forth um, go far enough? Do you think they need to go farther? Um, and maybe first, I can either turn it over to Lindsay or Natalie. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, Natalie? Yeah, I mean, so I'll just I'll just briefly repeat what what I said earlier, uh, which is that um, you know I think first we need you know we need transparency about um, about how content is governed uh, online, both both paid and un unpaid content. And the the Honest Ads Act is uh, like Lindsay said a, a no brainer uh, place to start. You know, it's unfortunate that there's a, a one man obstacle uh, in the way of of getting that bill passed, but it is what it is. Uh, at least for now. Uh, the, the second thing, which, and I think, again, the, the most impactful thing by far will be to pass, to pass uh, strong privacy, uh, privacy legislation uh, at the federal level. And I think that one of the goals of, of, that, uh, of, of that should be to make the types of, um, of, of discriminatory targeting and, and, and the disparate impact that, that, that Morgan talked about uh, be as close to impossible to enact um, as, as, as as can be as can be done, uh, and and here again, I'll, I'll point people to um, to the ranking digital rights report, uh, which um, which I think the, the OTI account uh, graciously tweeted out uh, the link to uh, for for details on that. Uh, and then the third bit is uh, is reforming uh, corporate governance so that companies themselves uh, have to be accountable uh, not only to, uh, to to democratic oversight but also to uh, to their boards of directors. Uh, and to uh, and, and to their shareholders. I think once those things are in place, uh, I think at that point it will make it will make more sense to look at 
at, at, at section 230. Uh, there's some interesting uh, proposals out there. Um, so, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, clarifying what the original intent was, uh, you know, and, and, and certainly clarifying that um, disparate impact uh, liability laws, uh, you know, that the CDA should not be a shield uh, from that. That's something that I think there's very sound legal arguments uh, for. Uh, public knowledge uh, also has a, has a very interesting proposal out uh, to carve out uh, advertising specifically from uh, CDA protection, and I think that's, that's worth discussing. Um, but again, I, I don't, I think it's going to be much more impactful to focus on, uh, on, on transparency, privacy, and um, and corporate governance reform first, uh, especially since those three avenues don't have uh, the, the risk to freedom of expression that uh, intermediary liability uh, does. Thanks, Adley. Um, we're nearing the end of our time, but I want to give Morgan and Joe a chance to jump in if you have anything to add. Um, I'll just add one point really briefly. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with what has been said um, uh, by Natalie and Lindsay just now on these points. Um, uh, I think ultimately uh, um, the there needs to be uh, oversight and accountability uh, that means that companies are accountable for um, harms produced by the the um, optimization decisions um, made by their um, their algorithmic systems, whether that's ad targeting, ad delivery, or the you know engagement um, and and kind of personalization um, algorithms on the platforms. And I think transparency we need transparency in order to be able to know what those outcomes are uh, and then but but fundamentally the only way that we're really going to um shift this is is, is for the the companies to be held legally accountable when when they uh, there are human rights harms directly linked to the operations of their systems great thanks joe um so we're now ending uh, nearing the end of our time. Thank you so much to everyone for joining today's event. Um, thank you to our wonderful panelists for taking the time to speak with us today. I hope you found this conversation productive and helpful um, and be on the lookout for future work that I'm sure all of us will be doing in this space. Um, this event will be on YouTube if you'd like to access a recording afterwards. Um, and yeah, thank you and enjoy your day. <laughs>